You're on camera, Lauren. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. It's really a pleasure for me to introduce Mary. Uh, for the beginning. Uh, Mary joined Mary came over here in 2015 from Cornell. It's actually absolutely amazing what she has achieved in just, just under three years, two and a half years, really. Uh, because our thing is getting more and more complicated. We used to we change hobbies and look at a few data and do a bit of analysis. These days we have to do it again into programming, Python, R, I don't know what. Mary did an absolute fantastic job and actually in a very short time became a resource in the lab. And actually was teaching people about it and learning. So she actually learned a lot about code biology, Python programming, bioinformatics, population genetics, Korea, how, how things work in Korea. Uh, she presented her results. Size in Korea, once over at NOAA. If you have anything, nobody's already there. So, the twice in Korea, once at the World Fisheries Congress. And her presentations are always fantastic, so I'm really looking forward to this one. Uh, she has won a lot of awards, right? So, when she came the first visit, the first time, if she went to the Catholic Students Symposium, she won an award for the best student presentation. Just recently, she got the Faculty Merit Award. In between, she got an NSA. GFRB, so this is a really prestigious NSA fellowship, which is going to use for a PhD. Which well, didn't tell anybody that she really did a PhD for the second chapter of her master's, uh, but at least a fairly major part of it. Uh, so that was pretty impressive. She's an absolute excellent teacher. I had the fortune of actually having her as a TA twice, and she actually took me to shame the way she was organizing everything. And, uh, being very calm, whereas me running around and being stressed out because I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, she also volunteered, right? She actually volunteers at working here in the school here. Uh, she is really active in the, in the program here in, in SAS. And what's really quite impressive, in, in addition to all that, she actually found the most time to become the co founder uh, of the Public Common Project, which is essentially a project which allows people. Uh, to submit comments on federal regulations uh, in a fairly easy way. You could do that before, but now it's a lot easier, and, and she actually made it understandable, the whole process. Uh, so she really made quite a splash with that sort of, uh, with, with those sort of approaches. And as I said, she won an NSF GFRB, and what she's going to do with that, she's going to leave the school, but fortunately she's going to stay in the college. So she's moving over to forestry, uh, to work with Philippine uh, on, on some ocean modeling in between, because that's not enough. In between, she's going to do a one year internship at NOAA to work on the impacts of uh, future marriage uh, with, with uh, the work on the impacts of coastal community or fisheries management. So it's actually absolutely amazing what Mary has achieved in two and a half years. Right? I mean, it's, it's, I never had anybody <laughs> who achieved that much. So I'm really looking forward. First to the presentation, then to the defense, and what I'm really looking forward to watch Mary, what she's going to do in the next few years, because we are going to hear it all from her. I know that. So, Mary, with that, I'm very proud of you. And I'm looking forward to it. I want to thank you all for being here this morning. I, I'll be presenting on my master's research using next generation sequencing to determine the population structure of Pacific cod around the Korean Peninsula and uh, to describe adaptive divergence of Pacific cod over its transoceanic range. And I want to start today with a quick introduction to my study species, Pacific cod, which is a demersal marine finfish that's distributed along the continental shelf of the North Pacific Ocean, as you can see here highlighted in red. And the species consists of two large populations that were established from two different groups or evolutionary lineages of Pacific cod, which were isolated from each other during Pleistocene Ice Age. 
agents, according to some awesome research by Mike sitting right there, and then a few other people in this room as well. And we're interested in Pacific cod because it's targeted by economically valuable fisheries in multiple countries, including the United States, Russia, Japan, China, and South Korea. In the United States in particular, the Pacific cod fishery is actually larger than the Atlantic cod fishery. However, many of the southern stocks are considered depleted, including Salish Sea Pacific cod, which was named a NOAA species of concern in 2010. And as we found in the Gulf of Alaska after the 2015 blob event off of the Pacific Northwest Coast, Pacific cod display sensitivity to warming ocean waters, particularly to the associated food web changes. Pacific cod begin their life as zermersal weekly adhesive eggs, and then as juveniles settle into the near shore and are usually associated with seagrass and sand habitats. As they grow to adulthood, they move offshore into deeper, more marine waters. Many of the specifics of their life history traits, including growth rate and age at maturity, actually vary geographically, particularly between the more northern and more southern stocks. And then they are opportunistic predators and provide important food to marine mammals like the endangered stellar sea lion. But perhaps most importantly for population genetic studies, Pacific cod form large spawning aggregations from winter to early spring in order to reproduce. And the exact timing of that spawning differs by location. So while Korean cod stocks will spawn from December to late February, cod in the Gulf of Alaska have been observed spawning later from February to early May. Previous studies suggest that Pacific cod display some site fidelity to these spawning aggregates. One of these was a marker capture study completed in Alaska. So Rand et al. tagged cod at spawning sites during the spawning season. And these, this graph right here shows the main findings of that study. On the x-axis, we have the distance from that spawning site where they were released. And then on the y-axis, we have the probability of recapture. The red line shows the recapture during the subsequent spawning season, and the black line shows recapture during um, outside of the spawning season. And so what this is telling us is that cod are most likely to be recaptured nearby their spawning site during the spawning season, but outside of the spawning season, they can be recaptured up to 600 kilometers away from that spawning site. And we also have a microsatellite study from the Northeast Pacific which showed that adults have limited dispersal from their natal spawning aggregate. So building on this literature, uh, my master's research had two objectives. The objective of the first chapter was to apply population genetics to enhance specific cod management around the Korean Peninsula. And then in the second chapter, I took the data from my first chapter, combined it with existing genetic data from the Eastern Pacific, and, look, and explore the patterns of adaptive divergence across the transoceanic range of Pacific cod. For each of these objectives, I'll go through the specific research questions that we answered. I give a little bit of background for that chapter and then discuss my methods and results. Starting with my first chapter. So the three questions that we answered here uh, were, what is the fine scale genetic stock structure of Pacific cod around the Korean Peninsula? And is this structure temporally stable? And once we have figured out the stock structure, we could look at specific characteristics of each stock, beginning with whether or not we could assign a fish back to its natal stock. And then we also calculated the effective population sizes of each stock to assess adaptive potential. <coughs> so Pacific cod is a historically important fishery in Korea, and which is right there on their distribution map. But the fishery experienced severe declines in catch during the early 1950s, as you can see on this plot of Pacific cod catch by year from coastal Korean waters. And although catch has somewhat increased in most recent years, starting in the early 2000s, it still remains a fraction of what it used to be. Korean fisheries management first responded to low catch quantities by supporting stock enhancement programs in collaboration with fisheries cooperatives. In 1981, they began releasing hatchery and reared larvae annually into the water. And in 2005, they began the annual release of hatchery and reared juveniles. And I marked these two dates on our map over here. Management also recently created a fish stock rebuilding plan in 2006, which focuses mostly on the highly fished southern stocks. 
But Korean fishery scientists also recognize the need to understand the stock structure of Korean cod and the fact that it's critical to their rebuilding and management plans. This is because incorporating genetic stock structure into spatial management and stock assessments reduces the probability of exploiting local populations. So for example, if you have a highly subdivided species with low connectivity between the local populations, then intense fishing at one location can severely deplete that local population. On the other hand, if you have high connectivity between local populations, then each population can replenish the others and may be able to sustain a higher catch. When simulations based on Pacific cod use genetic structure to establish separate management units, they found that it not only increased the probability that catch, or sorry, stock size was maintained at target levels, but in some scenarios actually increased catch. There have been previous studies of stock structure around the Korean Peninsula. Starting with Kim et al. in 2010, he used 10 microsatellite loci, and they found two genetically distinct stocks, one which they call the western stock here, and then the eastern stock over here. But then in 2011, Black and Nakayama published their study using five microsatellite loci, and they reported three genetically distinct stocks, one on the western coast, one on the southern coast and one on the eastern coast. And so there's a mismatch in the apparent stock structure from previous studies. We also don't have a good idea of fine scale stock structure within the east coast each coastline. And we didn't have any temporal samples taken in previous studies. And so in order to approach these data and knowledge gaps, our study made use of a larger number of sampling sites, as well as next generation sequencing. We had seven sampling sites in total that were collected over two spawning seasons, one in the winter of 2007 to 2008, and one in the winter of 2014 to 2015. So from 2007 to 2008 spawning season, we had one site collected from each coast. So this is the western coast right here, one site on the southern coast, and then one site on the eastern coast. Three additional sampling sites were uh, collected on the southern coast in 2014 to 2015, Namhae, Goje, and Pohang. And then an additional west coast site was sampled in 2015-2016 at a yellow sea management block right here. We also had a between-year temporal replicate at Goje. So Goje was sampled in 2013 as well as 2014. And we had a within-year temporal replicate at Jinhae Bay which was sampled in both December and February of the same spawning season to test for distinct waves of spawning pod at the same location. We sequenced these samples using restriction site associated DNA sequencing or RAD-C, which allows us to scan the entire genome for single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. Represented in this figure right here, a SNP is a change in a single base pair in a DNA sequence. So each of my genetic markers are composed of a single SNP, and the allele at that locus is which base pair that sequence has. And in this study, we had a total of 5,804 markers, so a good increase from those 5 and 10 microsatellite studies. And then we retained 243 individuals across all sampling sites for analysis which allowed us to answer that first question, what is the fine scale genetic stock structure of Pacific cod, and is that structure temporally stable? We began with a principal component analysis, or a PCA, which takes the variation in almost 6,000 genetic markers and puts it into two composite variables that are then plotted on the X and Y axes. And in this PCA, each individual point represents a single fish and the line connects that fish to the centroid of its sampling site. And the sampling sites are colored according to the site markers on the map up here. So the first thing that should jump out at you is that there are three very distinct clusters in our PCA. One composed of the western sampling sites, one of the southern sampling sites, and one of that eastern sampling site. And so these represent three genetically distinct stocks of Pacific cod. So this confirms those results from Guac and Nakayama. In 2011, their 2011 study. And even though our samples were collected across two spawning seasons, the spatial differentiation here overwhelms any kind of temporal differentiation. So we think that this stock structure is temporally stable. 
Now, because we have so much distance between the regions, it's really difficult to see any kind of differentiation between the southern sites or between our temporal replicates. And so I ran another principal component analysis where I removed the eastern and the western sites. And so in here, again, we have each point being an individual fish and the color matches up with the site map right here. The temporal replicate at Jinhe Bay that within your replicate is represented by two shades of blue. And the between your replicate at Goje is represented by two shades of purple. And so as you can see on this PCA, we don't see a lot of genetic differentiation, either spatially within the southern coast or between our temporal replicates. Now to put into perspective how interesting it is to see this kind of stock structure in a marine fish species, I want to show you a quick comparison with Pacific cod populations from the eastern side of the Pacific. This scatter plot shows genetic differentiation on the y-axis measured as, as FST. So the higher the FST value, the greater the genetic differentiation. And on the x-axis, we have the distance between pairs of sampling sites in kilometers. So our North American samples are in blue, and they follow a positive linear slope. So the greater the distance between each pair of samples, the greater the genetic differentiation. Our Korean samples are in red. We have a cluster down here which represents within region comparisons, so the di genetic differentiation between two southern sampling sites or two western sampling sites. And then this cluster up here represents between region comparisons, so between a western site and a southern site. And as you can see up here, all of our between region comparisons have a greater FST than is seen between any of the sites on the North American side and at much smaller distances. So we're on the North American side to reach an FST of about 0.03, the sites had to be over 4,000 kilometers apart. On the Korean side, we see that kind of differentiation over 100 kilometers. We do have a hypothesis as to why we might be seeing such high genetic differentiation over such small spatial scales around the Korean Peninsula. We think that is due in part to past glaciation in the region, since Pleistocene Ice Ages had a huge effect on the marine environment around the Korean Peninsula. So what this graph is showing you is the current land boundaries in gray. And then tan represents the historical extent of land masses during periods of glaciation when sea levels fell drastically. The entire yellow sea right here along the western coast is exposed, and most of the eastern sea is covered by a glacier. And then this inch set shows you the Korea Strait along the southern coastline, which became much narrower and shallower. So these changes in topography from falling sea levels may have forced eastern and western Pacific cod into two separate glacial refugia, the one in the eastern sea right here, and then one along the Okinawa Trail right here. And this would have allowed those two populations to become differentiated in isolation over time. The differentiation that built up during glacial periods may be reinforced by ongoing local adaptations to different thermal regimes. The current oceanography around the Korean Peninsula is really complex and interesting and cre creates very large temperature differentials between coasts. The Tsushima warm current, marked by these red lines here, brings warmer, more saline waters along the southern coasts and along the southeastern coasts as well before it departs from the coastline at about the location of our southeastern sampling site right here in gray. And then the North Korean cold current and the Korean coastal current bring much colder waters along the eastern and the western coastlines. So for example, seawater temperature data from a depth of 100 meters in February 2006 showed that near shore temperatures on the eastern coast ranged from zero to four degrees C, but along the southern coast at our sampling site at Jinhe Bay were from 13 to 17 degrees Celsius. It's a very large temperature difference. In summary, in answer to this first question, we found that there are three genetically distinct stocks around the Korean Peninsula. That stock structure is temporally stable, and we think that it reflects a combination of demographic history during past ice ages and ongoing local adaptation. So while we were answering this question, we actually stumbled on a, an additional question that we could answer with our data, which we hadn't originally set out to look into. And that was, do Pacific 
uh, display site fidelity to their natal stock around the Korean Peninsula. If we return to this PCA where each individual point is an individual fish and the site where they're caught is color coded, you can see that we have these individuals here that are genetically clustering with a different stock than the one where they were caught. And so six individuals appear to have migrated from their natal western stock to the southern coast. Three individuals appear to have migrated from the west to the east, and one individual appears to have migrated from the south to the east. Which means that we have a total of 10 individuals that are migrating counterclockwise around the peninsula during the spawning season. When we first saw this pattern, we were a little skeptical because we wouldn't expect this rate of migration between stocks that are so genetically differentiated, especially when those fish are spawning. However, we also have overlook microchemistry data from five of these 10 migrant individuals, which appear to have migrated from the western stock to the southern coast. And the otolith data actually confirms the presence of those migrants. So the otolith or ear bone right here accrues layers over time like a tree. And as each layer is deposited, it incorporates some aspect of the water chemistry from the area around the fish when that layer is, was created. So the otolith microchemistry from the most recent adult phase represented by the edge of the otolith of our migrant individuals closely matches fish from the southern coast where they were caught. However, the otolith microchemistry from the juvenile phase of our migrants most closely matches the microchemistry from west coast fish to which the migrants were genetically assigned. So we know that these are actually true migrant individuals. We're also not the first study to document individual movement between stocks around the Korean Peninsula during the spawning season. Guam and Nakayama in 2011, uh, using microsatellites, found a mixed composition aggregate along the northeast coast right here. And in this aggregate, there were Pacific cod from both the southern and the eastern stocks. So the presence of these migrants brings up two questions. The first is, is a specific subset of the stock migrating during the spawning season? And then are these migrants actually contributing to the next generation? Luckily, we have all of the data that was taken when these fish were sampled, which includes total length and body weight data, which I used to answer that first question. So in this graph, we have total length along the x-axis and body weight along the y-axis. Each point is an individual fish, and the triangular points are the migrant individuals. So we're looking at the west coast stock, which means the migrants were fish that were born in the west and migrated to the southern or the eastern coast. And I've color-coded the points by sex so that we can look at sex-specific length at maturity estimates. This vertical blue line represents the 50% length at maturity estimate for males, and the vertical red line represents the 50% length at maturity estimate for females. Based on those maturity lines, both of our male migrants down here are mature fish but only five out of seven of our female migrants were mature fish. So the migrants are a mix of mature and immature individuals. If we look at the migrants' location and the overall distribution of total length and body weight, most of them are in the lower 50% for both of those metrics. So we can hypothesize that these are either immature fish or they're younger fish that have more recently become mature. Which bears the question, are those mature migrants contributing to the next generation? And if they are, we should be seeing hybrids in our data set. One of the ways that we can look for hybrids in genetic data is a structure plot. In a structure plot, each bar represents an individual. And the colors of that bar indicate the proportion of that individual's DNA that's most closely assigned to a baseline for a particular population. So we have a Western stock female mate with a southern stock male. They should have a hybrid offspring where the bar is 50% colored for the western stock and 50% colored for the southern stock. When we made a structure plot out of every individual in our data set, we saw two very striking patterns. The first is that the migrant fish are really easy to pick out. There are these large bars of western stock DNA mixed in with our southern and east coast fish. And the second is that we don't really see any hybridization in this plot. We do see evidence of low levels of gene flow between the stocks over evolutionary timescales, 
represented by these small proportions of DNA carried over between stocks. But we don't actually see any F1 hybrids here. So in summary, in answering this question, we found that there was a lot of individual movement between stocks during the spawning season, so they may not necessarily be displaying site fidelity to their natal stock. But even though some of these individuals were mature, we don't see any evidence of hybridization or that they're mating with non-native fish. And we think that there's two uh, potential explanations for this, which aren't mutually exclusive. The first is skipped spawning. Skipped spawning occurs when an annually reproducing fish doesn't reproduce for a given year. And this is actually pretty frequently frequent in marine fish and has been observed in Atlantic cod. So if we have some of these mature individuals being skipped spawners, it means that our actual effective migration rate is much lower. The second explanation is that migrants are spawning, but they have a lower reproductive success than our native fish. And so they're not contributing as much material to the next generation as the native fish are. And that would also lower our effective migration rate. Our second question for this chapter, which became even more important once we realized the frequency of migrants in our data set, was can we assign a fish back to its natal stock? And the short answer to this question is yes, we can. We had 100% success assigning individuals back to their native stock across every single stock, so west, south, and eastern stocks. And we were able to do so with only 100 loci. So even though our study used almost 6,000 genetic markers, assignment could be completed in the future with only 100 of those markers. And that means that there's great potential here for the development of a cost-effective high throughput panel of 100 loci for management to use in monitoring and further research. The final question for this chapter is what are the effective population sizes of Pacific cod stocks? So we wanted to quantify the adaptive potential of these stocks. And effective population size is a metric that we use to look at adaptive potential. In an actual marine population with a census size of NC, we have a lot of evolutionary processes at play like migration, mutation, natural selection. And we also have a lot of messy demographic characteristics like unequal sex ratios and overlapping generations. So effective population size, or NE, is the size of what you can think of as a model population where the only process affecting that population is genetic drift. And we want to calculate the size of that model population that would have an equivalent amount of genetic drift as our census population. We do this because a high effective population size or a high ME indicates that the population has a higher adaptive capacity because of high levels of genetic diversity from low rates of inbreeding. Whereas a low effective population size indicates a lower adaptive capacity from reduced genetic diversity. Our Korean stock effective population size estimates ranged from 800 to the lower 2000s, which is well within that range that we would expect to see reduced adaptive capacity and low genetic diversity. And to kind of put into perspective just how low these estimates are for a marine population, I can compare them to the effective population sizes of our Eastern Pacific cod. And so as you can see here, at the majority of these sampling sites, we have much higher effective population sizes than the Korean stocks, with the interesting ex exception of these two um, more southern groups, sampled at Hecate Strait and the Washington coastline. Small effective population sizes can be caused by recent declines in the census population size, as you would see from a bottleneck event. And it can also be caused by high variation in reproductive success, where you might have only a few breeders that are actually contributing to the next generation. And for Korean stocks specifically, low ME may be a signature of stock depletion from recent overfishing, which we saw in that graph earlier. Or it could be a result of stock enhancement programs, since stock enhancement programs are known to use a relatively few number of breeders for each generation. However, we do know that the stock enhancement programs on the southern coast actually use wild, new wild brood stock each year. And so we wouldn't expect that to have quite as much of an effect on effective population size here. 
if you want to know why, you can come to Charlie's talk on Thursday. I'll explain it for you. <laughs> In conclusion, we saw very small effective population sizes in the Korean cod stocks. And so from a genetics perspective, we would recommend that management monitor the effect of their stock enhancement programs and the uh, census sizes of these populations. And that concludes my first chapter. So the objective of my second chapter was to take the data from the Korean Peninsula and combine it with that Eastern Pacific data in order to explore patterns of adaptive divergence across the transition and range of Pacific cod. And this part of my master's, we sought to establish more of a foundational scientific knowledge of the species and adaptive evolution in marine populations in general. We answered three questions pertaining to this objective. How genetically different are East and West Pacific cod? How do signatures of adaptive evolution compare between East and West Pacific cod? And then how do characteristics of genome-wide divergence differ across the divergent scenarios represented by Pacific cod? If you recall, East and West Pacific cod are those two populations on either side of the North Pacific, which were isolated from each other in separate glacial refugia. And I just presented on the rat sequencing from the Korean Peninsula, which represents the Western population in this study. The Hauser Lab has also completed rat sequencing on Pacific cod from the coasts of Alaska, British Columbia, and Washington, which represents the Eastern population in this study. And the result is a transoceanic data set that lets us look at uh, the evolution of divergence on very large spatial scales. When I say divergence, I'm referring to the process by which two groups which belong to the same ancestral population become genetically differentiated from each other over time. The opposing force is gene flow, which is when individuals migrate between the populations and then successfully reproduce. So whereas divergence, creates genetic differentiation, gene flow is a homogenizing force. Divergence can then be further broken down into two categories. Adaptive divergence arises from local adaptation to selection pressures, and neutral divergence represents random changes across the genome, which we also like to call genetic drift. And there are three major ways or scenarios through which divergence can occur in wild populations. The first scenario is divergence without gene flow. So in this scenario, we have two groups that are part of the same population exchanging high levels of gene flow, which then become isolated in either space or time. And that isolation is going to cut off all gene flow and allow the groups to accumulate neutral or adaptive changes. And those changes are represented by the change in color along each of these lineages. This scenario is best represented by Eastern versus Western Pacific cod, which were established from two separate evolutionary lineages, and at least where we sample, do not currently exchange gene flow. The next two scenarios deal with divergence with gene flow, starting with a secondary model. Again, we have that isolating barrier that's introduced, which cuts off all gene flow. Except this time, the isolating barrier is actually eventually removed, re-establishing gene flow between the two groups. That gene flow is going to homogenize the groups, washing out some of their differences and eroding divergence over time. And this is best represented by the Korean cod stocks in the Western population, which we think were separated in separate glacial refugia, but have since come back into secondary contact and now exchange low levels of gene flow. In the primary model, we have two groups that are continuously exchanging gene flow, but strong selection pressures in their local environments allow them to accumulate adaptive changes over time. And this is represented by that eastern population. So since the different groups of Pacific cod represent each of these three scenarios, we can use the species to study how divergence occurs over time in large marine populations. And studying wild populations is really critical to disentangling the evolutionary forces at play in the marine environment. This is because large marine populations are exposed to a variety of different selection pressures, constantly changing environmental conditions, 
and varying levels of connectivity. So terrestrial studies or lab studies of model species may not uh, encompass the complexity of marine systems when studying evolution and divergence. By focusing specifically on adaptive divergence, we can identify functional regions of the genome which may help Pacific cod respond to environmental change like ocean warming. For our study, we identified adaptive divergence at both the individual locus and the genome-wide levels. There are multiple uh, methods to identify individual loci under selection, which we also call outlier loci. We used three of these methods implemented in the program SpaceAN, Outflank, and PC Adapt. And we then filtered for individual loci that were identified in two or more of those programs. And you can see those loci highlighted in red on this plot of locus specific differentiation. To measure adaptive divergence at the genome wide level, we use a sliding window analysis. By aligning each of our Pacific cod loci to the Atlantic cod genome, we were able to calculate a weighted moving average of genetic differentiation across each linkage group or chromosome. So we have to call them linkage groups because the genome isn't fully assembled yet, but it's essentially a chromosome. And on this graph here, we have linkage group 15, and each of these points represent individual loci. And then the red line is our weighted moving average of genetic differentiation. We then generated a 95% confidence interval, which is this gray area right here, using permutation tests. And that 95% confidence interval represents the level of genetic differentiation or the FST value that we would expect from neutral divergence alone, so random changes across the genome. That means that any time our moving average line goes above the 95% confidence interval, it's a signature of adaptive divergence. And we call these areas of the genome as a whole regions of elevated divergence. We apply these analysis methods to subsets of the Korean COD data set and the Eastern Pacific COD data set from Diamond et al. 2018. Our Eastern population data set was composed of the coastal stocks from Jainan et al., so six sampling sites which we considered six separate subpopulations from the Eastern Pacific. And the global FST among those sites was 0 0.01. Our Western population was represented by two of the Korean cod stocks, the Southern Coast stock and then the Western Coast stock. And the pairwise genetic differentiation between those two subpopulations was 0 0.037. So we do have an increase in overall divergence between the Eastern and Western population. Our final data set consisted of 4,286 loci, all of which we aligned to the 23 language groups of the Atlantic cod genome. And we retained a total of 219 individuals from our Western population and 260 individuals from our Eastern population for final analysis. Our first question for this chapter was fairly straightforward. We wanted to quantify the overall divergence between Eastern and Western Pacific cod using our RAD sequencing data. And to do this, we used an analysis of molecular variance, or an AMOVA. And the AMOVA told us that about 58% of the total variance in our data set could be attributed to the genetic differences between the Eastern and the Western population. The AMOVA also gives us a measure of genetic differentiation of B statistics right here. And you can think of the B statistic as similar to FST. So B statistic of zero indicates very low genetic differentiation and of one indicates very high genetic differentiation. Our B statistic between the East and the West population was 0.58, which is really high for within species comparison of a marine fish. To put that into perspective, the B statistic between populations of herring that spawn at two completely different times of the year is only 0 0.013. So very high differentiation between East and West Pacific cod. In contrast, only 0.5% of the total variation in our data set could be explained by genetic differences between subpopulations within the East or within the Western population of Pacific cod. 
And the C statistic between subpopulations is also much lower at 0 0.0123. So to answer our first question, Pacific cod on the east and west sides of the Pacific are very different from each other. Our second question focused specifically on adaptive divergence. We wanted to compare signatures of adaptive divergence between the Eastern and Western Pacific cod. And if you recall from the method section, we looked at adaptive divergence at both the individual locus and at the genome-wide level. At the individual locus level, we found no outlier loci that were shared between the East and West Pacific. And then at the genome-wide scale, we found only one region of elevated divergence that was shared in our sliding window analyses. And I showed this region here, so it was on linkage group 19. And for easier visualization, I've actually removed those 95% confidence intervals, and I've just marked the region of elevated divergence with dotted lines. The red line is for the eastern population, and the blue line is the moving average of genetic differentiation for the western population. We came up with a few hypotheses to explain why we may be seeing such little overlap in adaptive divergence between east and west Pacific cod. The first is that these two groups could be under different selection pressures because we sampled on such different spatial scales. Since the Eastern Pacific was sampled over a large geographic range, the dominant selection pressures on that side of the Pacific may be environmental variables that change on latitudinal lines. Whereas on the, on the Western population around the Korean Peninsula, we had sampling sites that were very closely clustered together, and so they could be experiencing different dominant selection pressures. On the other hand, our second hypothesis is that they are under the same selection pressures and they're just responding by using different genes. So that really high AMOVA P statistic suggests that it's possible there's been some divergence in gene function since the two groups are part of the same ancestral population. And then finally, of course, we do have to acknowledge that it's possible we're just not picking up a signal of the shared adaptive divergence. We had relatively low marker density for these types of studies, and because we didn't have a Pacific cod genome, we did have to align to the Atlantic cod genome, which may have uh, caused some bias in our data set towards more conserved sequences, and which forced us to make the assumption that there was no difference in gene order between the species or within Pacific cod. We can actually address the second hypothesis with the data that we have by looking at the functions of the Atlantic cod genes to which our Pacific cod loci aligned. So I looked at associated gene functions for both the outlier locus loci and the loci that fell within that shared region of elevated divergence on linkage group 19. And I found several loci on the east and the west Pacific which were linked to circadian rhythms. So three loci in the Western population aligned to the same gene, which was involved in circadian entrainment. And then an additional locus in the Western population aligned to a gene functionally linked to the circadian rhythm of daytime contrast sensitivity. And we had one locus in the Eastern population, which aligned to a gene involved in the photoreception pathway in the retina that's necessary for light-dependent circadian systems. And I had to refresh my memory on biological clocks before fully understanding the connection between these three genes. I found that circadian entrainment is the process by which a circadian clock is synchronized to an environmental cycle. So in light-based entrainment, the clock is synced based on differences in light intensity and duration, also known as daytime contrast sensitivity. And as you can tell from this diagram, Light-based circadian rhythms depend on synchronization through photoreception in the retina that sends those signals to the brain. And light-based circadian rhythms are actually known to drive a decent amount of fish behavior, particularly reproductive behavior. For example, photoperiod stimulates gonad maturation in stippleback and a certain species of salmon. Since exact spawn timing in Pacific cod varies by geographic location, particularly between the more northern and the more southern latitudes, we think it's possible that circadian rhythms may play a role in initiating annual reproduction on both sides of the Pacific. We also assessed whether adaptive divergence had similar impacts on population structuring on the eastern and western sides of the Pacific. 
And we did this by conducting more principal component analysis, except this time we broke up the loci by whether they were neutral, so not contributing to adaptive divergence, or whether they were outliers. And then we compared the clustering patterns in our outlier and our neutral PCA. There was no difference in clustering in our Western population between the outlier and the neutral PCA, but we did see a difference in our Eastern population. This is the PCA for the Eastern population using only neutral loci. So just to refresh your memory, each individual point is an individual fish, and the color matches the site where they were sampled, which is on this map down here. And so in this PCA with the neutral loci, we see a distance-based clustering where that space in the middle matches this gap in the sampling regime along the Canadian coastline. When we used only outlier loci, two things happened. The first was that the Kodiak Island sample on here in the PCA and then down here on the map moved to span the gap between the more northern and the more southern sampling sites. And the second thing that happened is that our Prince William Sound sample, which came from right here, actually split into two separate groups, one which clustered with the southern sampling sites in Kodiak Island, and one which clustered with the northern sampling sites. In conclusion, we saw little overlap in signatures of adaptive divergence between eastern and western Pacific cod at both the locus and genome-wide levels, but we think this is because of potentially the divergence between the groups, and we did see some similarity in gene function between the two. We also found that adaptive divergence had a much stronger impact on population structure in the Eastern Pacific than in the Western Pacific. And that brings us to our third and final question. How uh, do characteristics of genome-wide divergence differ across the three divergence scenarios represented by Pacific Cod? Just a quick reminder of our divergence scenarios. We have divergence without gene flow, represented by the eastern versus the western populations. The secondary model of divergence with gene flow, represented by the western populations. And the primary model of divergence with gene flow, represented by the eastern population. Since we wanted to compare adaptive divergence at the genome-wide level, we used our sliding window analyses. And we looked at the width and frequency of the regions of elevated divergence across scenarios. So width we quantified as the number of averages within that region of elevated divergence, and frequency as the number of regions per linkage group. And we found two trends which were not statistically significant. The first was that the mean size per region of divergence increased from the divergence without gene flow scenario to the primary model of divergence with gene flow. And then the mean number of regions per linkage group actually did decrease from the divergence without gene flow scenario to the primary model of divergence with gene flow. And the only significant comparison was the mean number of regions per linkage group between the divergence without gene flow scenario and the primary model of divergence with gene flow. So our primary our takeaway from this analysis was that more regions of elevated divergence form during divergence without gene flow than divergence with gene flow, although the only statistically significant difference was with that primary model of divergence with gene flow. And for this chapter, I have two additional analyses that I won't present on today, but are still in progress. The first is that we're going to use regression analysis to correlate temperatures specifically to allele frequencies to look more into adaptive divergence on either side of the Pacific. And the second is that we're going to use a measure, a measure of language disequilibrium to explore chromosomal inversions as the architecture underlying those regions of divergence. And just to wrap that all up for you, we had four uh, recommendations for management from the first chapter of my thesis. The first is that Korean cod be managed as three separate stops. The second was that there's a great potential for management to develop a high throughput panel for monitoring these stops. We also suggest that Korean fishery scientists explore hybridization between stocks to fully understand all of that migration going on. And finally, that management monitor their stock and cancer programs and their rebuilding plans, keeping that low effective population size in mind. 
The three conclusions we drew from our second chapter is that eastern and western populations of the Pacific Pad are extremely diverged from each other, and this may explain why we did not observe an overlap in signatures of adaptive divergence. Ultimately, future research on the species should focus on the development of a Pacific Pod linkage map and genome assembly to draw more specific conclusions on the characteristics of genome-wide adaptive divergence across those three divergence centers. And before I take questions, I just want to go through my acknowledgments. I want to thank Lorenz for taking me on as an undergrad and handing me this very, very cool project, which allowed me to travel to Korea and learn a lot more than I knew previously about genetics and population genetics of fish. Um, and then I also want to thank my committee, Carrie, Tom, who is sequestered in jury duty right now, and <laughs> Mike for lending me their expertise and their support throughout this whole process. Uh, Dr. Mustaf Wok is one of our Korean collaborators, and as is Dr. Stukyung Kang who both graciously provided us with samples and regional expertise and were fantastic hosts when we went to visit Korea. And then Kristen Grubenthal, a previous member of our lab who did the heavy lifting on the rad sequencing on the eastern side of the Pacific. I couldn't have completed my degree without uh, funding from SACS and support from SACS administrators, as well as funding from the College of the Environment. And most of the research funding came from the Alaska Fishery Science Center and Korea's National Institute of Fishery Science. The Korea-U.S. Science Cooperation Center were the people who actually paid the bills when I went over to Korea, so I'm very thankful for that because those were pretty amazing trips. And then all of our sequencing was completed at the University of Oregon Support Facility. And then past and present members of Mur Lab who supported me on lab work, on bioinformatics, mental and emotional support as well. Isadora, our amazing lab manager. Uh, Dan and Marie, who taught all of us pretty much everything we know about bioinformatics and we're really to troubleshoot everything all the time. Uh, and then Charlie, Eleni, Molly, Natalie, Sam, and Maya. And I also want to thank Karita for helping the advice with lab work and then Ryan and Ramon for livening up our lab meetings and also being our fellow geneticists on the second floor of MAM. And of course, uh, the SAS grad community, which I think is an incredibly supportive and amazing community to be a part of, especially as a master's student who had just moved across the country to somewhere she'd never lived before. Um, and then friends and family for patience and support throughout my journey. And now I can take some questions. <laughs> Okay, so we have a few minutes of questions, and then I'm going to kick out everybody, and then I keep the committee here behind, and we question Mary a bit more, but before we do this, the floor is open for any questions. No? Yes. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> um, I'm still fascinated by the lack of isolation by distance in the Western Pacific population from your first chapter. Mm -hmm. You have a strong disconnect between the Eastern and Western Pacific, which implies there is an isolation by distance thing happening at that broader scale. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, did, did you guys consider oceanographic circulation patterns for potential dispersal that might lead to different isolation depending which way you move around the Korean Peninsula? Um, we did not, but that's a really excellent point, and I think that the oceanography and potentially dispersal has a big effect around the Korean Peninsula. There's been a lot of research in other marine species on the marginal seas, like in this area itself, where they found that structure pretty much follows um, the location of those marginal seas, like the Yellow Sea and the East Sea, so there's definitely the potential that that dispersal is keeping um, individuals within specific coastlines. I think one of the things that we did talk about was since the migration patterns were all one way around the peninsula, it's possible that some larvae are accidentally being advected to other locations um, and then either migrating back to reproduce or not contributing to the next generation. So yeah, that's a really good point. Your analysis of the, the eastern populations at the outlier low side, the results from Pennsylvania Center are absolutely striking. And 
uh, I know that, I mean, I think you've gotten to look at, there's some evidence there that, you know, that genes affecting circadian rhythm might be contributing to what they call stationary and migratory ecotypes. Mm -hmm. And it's probably a common phenomenon in gadgets and such. But that really wouldn't account for why they split and cluster along those reason. I'm sure the assignment tests weren't very conclusive about anything either because they're too close. Uh, so what, what do you think might be going on with that? Well, we've discussed a few hypotheses for this. Um, one of them is that the sound was sampled in several different locations. So there may have been mixed aggregates and they sampled different parts of those aggregates and came up with different fish. Um, another is that there are uh, early and late spawning cod or two or migratory and stationary ecotypes, or maybe a migratory ecotype might go into the Bering Sea or out to the Aleutian Islands where there's a lot of different oceanic pressures going on there. And the stationary ecotype might stay within that Gulf of Alaska stock, which would have very different pressures than the Aleutians and Bering Sea. So I think those are our two main theories of I mean, you think that phenomenon might be recreated in the inshore waters of southeast Alaska where we have multiple isolated, semi-isolated basins. This could be going on all the way down to the Salish Sea and beyond. So yeah, definitely. I think, well, especially given the fact that in Atlantic how they see that a lot in the fjord structure where a lot of the like enclosed fjords have both stationary and migratory and they've got those chromosome inversions that prevent them from intermixing. Um, so yeah, I think it's definitely possible you could see something similar like that, especially in Southeast Alaska, where you have a very similar like landscape and oceanography. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was just curious to the, the degree to which cod are mixing during other times of the year. And I know there was that the Italian study, but I was wondering if like any of the work work too indicated that like during the middle times that they're all over the place, or are they kind of contained? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so. Based on the tagging studies, they move very long distances, so we think they are pretty mixed up outside of the spawning season. The Odalic work so far has focused primarily on during the spawning season, and we haven't dug into between spawning seasons yet. Um, I think that if we did, we might see more movement, simply, especially around the Korean Peninsula, because everything is so close together. So if a cod can migrate up to 600 kilometers, it can definitely circumvent the whole Korean Peninsula. Yeah, but I definitely think that's something else we could do with the odor data as well. Um, assuming that the water chemistry is different enough between the two bodies of water. Um, yeah, so you mentioned earlier that Pacific, we learned kind of the hard way that Pacific card, are, at least on the eastern side, are very sensitive to temperature. And then also noticed that the temperatures around the Korean Peninsula are quite strikingly different from temperatures you would encounter around Alaska. As, and I didn't see it, a lot of analysis so far, I guess, about room temperature and how like you're going to continue that. But I was wondering if you've seen anything just in your work so far, interesting genes related to temperature. Mm -hmm. or, um, yeah, so the genes that I didn't put up here, there's a bunch associated with like neural pathways and memory functions. Um, so not temperature associated, but that's the majority of the other genes that I'm seeing, which is why I want to run that regression to specifically pull out temperature because, I mean, given those temperature differentials and the fact that the larvae, like on the southern coast, are believed to be in Jinhei Bay, which is that very high temperature location, that early life history stage, I would expect some kind of selection pressure to go on there. So we haven't seen any quite yet, um, and I'm hoping that we pick that up in the regression. I think the other problem is that since we're relying on the Atlantic cod genome, we could be seeing those more neural pathway, um, like brain functioning genes, simply because they might be more conserved between the species. And so, since we're aligning to Atlantic cod, we're kind of might be filtering out some of the temperature associated genes that could be more variable. Um, yes. So, in summary, not yet, but I hope so. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, you flew in for the That's <laughs> amazing. Let's just say, we're keeping Mary here for the equation as well as the core, and then we can go to the